Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we delve into the lore of the vampire, a mythical creature steeped in the shadows of our collective imagination. The vampire is a being that sustains itself by feasting on the vital essence of the living, typically in the form of blood. In the annals of European folklore, vampires emerge as undead entities, once familiar faces who return to visit loved ones, leaving a trail of mischief and, alas, sometimes death in the neighborhoods they once inhabited while among the living. These creatures were not the pale, gaunt figures we envision today. Rather, they wore shrouds and were described as bloated, with ruddy or dark countenances. The transformation of the vampire myth over time is quite fascinating. Our modern notion of the vampire, that of a pale and slender immortal, took root in the early 19th century. This stands in stark contrast to the plump and robust vampires of old European tales. Yet vampires are not confined to the cultural boundaries of Europe alone. Throughout the world, various vampiric entities have left their mark on folklore. The term vampire gained popularity in Western Europe during the 18th century, fueled by reports of mass hysteria and the pre-existing folk belief in Southeastern and Eastern Europe. This hysteria sometimes led to the staking of corpses and accusations of vampirism. Local variations of these creatures are plenty. In Southeastern Europe, they don different names such as Striga in Albania, Vricolakas in Greece, and Strigoi in Romania, the latter cognate to the Italian Striga, meaning witch. In our modern era, the vampire has been relegated to the realm of fiction, yet pockets of belief in vampiric creatures persist in some cultures, with entities like the chupacabra keeping the flame alive. Early beliefs in vampires are often linked to the ignorance of the body's natural decomposition after death, a mystery people in pre-industrial societies sought to rationalize through the creation of the vampire myth. Porphyria, a medical condition, briefly found itself entwined with vampire legends in 1985, gaining substantial media attention. However, subsequent scrutiny largely discredited this association. Let's take a journey into the depths of time, where the roots of vampirism extend back millennia. Imagine the ancient cultures of Mesopotamia, the Hebrews, the ancient Greeks, Manipuri and Romans, each with tales of demons and spirits that can be seen as the precursors to the modern vampire. While vampiric creatures made occasional appearances in the folklore of these ancient civilizations, the vampire as we know it today finds its origins predominantly in the early 18th century, specifically in southeastern Europe. It was during this time that the verbal traditions of various ethnic groups in the region were documented and published. In these tales, vampires often emerge as revenants, returning from the dead, usually as evil beings, suicide victims or witches. The law also suggests alternative origins, such as malevolent spirits taking possession of corpses, or the transformative act of being bitten by a vampire. It's a diverse array of spooky scenarios, to say the least. However, belief in these legends took a turn toward the extreme in some regions, reaching a point where it triggered mass hysteria. Picture this. Public executions of individuals suspected to be vampires. Yes, you heard that right. In certain areas, the fear of these blood-sucking creatures became so intense that it led to the unfortunate demise of those deemed guilty of vampirism. Picture, if you will, a vampire bloated in appearance, with a complexion veering towards ruddy, purplish, or dark hues. These physical traits were often linked to recent indulgence in the crimson nectar of life, as tales told of blood seeping from the mouth and nose of the creature, particularly when glimpsed in its shroud or coffin. Adding a macabre touch, the left eye of the vampire was said to remain open, staring into the beyond. 
In its afterlife attire, the vampire would be clad in the very linen shroud in which it met its earthly end. A touch of the grotesque manifested in the reported growth of teeth, hair, and nails, though fangs, as we envision them today, were not a consistent feature in these ancient tales. Now imagine this. As you stroll past the moonlit cemetery, you might hear the unsettling sounds of chewing emanating from the graves. Yes, my friends, chewing sounds, a peculiar detail that found its way into many accounts of encounters with these nocturnal fiends. In Slavic and Chinese traditions, the path to vampiric transformation was paved with peculiar markers. Take heed, for any unfortunate soul whose earthly vessel was leaped over by an animal, particularly a dog or a cat, risked the unsettling fate of becoming one of the undead. Additionally, a corpse bearing wounds left untreated with the purifying touch of boiling water was deemed susceptible to the vampiric curse. Delving into Russian folklore, we find a unique twist to the origin of vampires. These creatures were said to be once witches or individuals who dared to rebel against the Russian Orthodox Church during their mortal lives. A somber consequence awaited those who chose such paths, lingering beyond the veil of death. Now, let's shift our gaze to the hills of Albanian folklore, where the Dampir emerges, a hybrid progeny born of curious unions. The Karkang's Hole, a lycanthropic creature clad in an iron mail shirt, or the Lugat, a water-dwelling ghost or monster, play central roles in the Dampir's lineage. If a Dampir is born of a Karkang's Hole, it possesses the unique ability to discern its lupine parent, leading to the saying, the Dampir knows the Lugat. Interestingly, the Lugat, invisible to the common eye, can only meet its end at the hands of a Dampir, a dynamic interplay between the supernatural and the mortal. Notably, the Lugat can take various forms, from animals and revenants to living people during their slumber. Such intricate folklore serves as the foundation for the belief that Dampirs, often the offspring of a Lugat, hold the key to confronting and vanquishing these elusive water-dwelling entities. And for those curious about surnames, know that Dampiraj stands as an Albanian family name, a subtle reminder of the intertwining threads between myth and reality. A myriad of methods of prevention emerged, each aiming to stave off the possibility of a deceased soul transforming into a malevolent force. One of those methods was the act of burying a corpse upside down. Widespread in its practice, this custom was believed to hinder the deceased from returning as a revenant. To further dissuade any potential demons or appease the departed soul, earthly objects like scythes or sickles were often placed near the grave. A peculiar resemblance to the ancient Greek practice of slipping an obelisk into the mouth of the deceased to pay passage across the river Styx in the underworld. The coin, in this case, doubled as a guardian against evil spirits, possibly sowing the seeds for later vampire folklore. In the realm of modern Greek folklore, the tradition persisted with a twist. To ward off the Rikolakas, a wax cross and a piece of pottery inscribed with Jesus Christ Conquers were placed upon the corpse, ensuring it remained undisturbed in its eternal slumber. Europe, too, had its share of peculiar practices. Severing tendons at the knees or scattering poppy seeds, millet or sand around the grave became commonplace. This method aimed to keep a presumed vampire occupied throughout the night as it meticulously counted each fallen grain. It seems our ancestors believed in the vampire's propensity for arithmomania, a curious association with numbers. Eastward, we'll find similar themes. Chinese narratives echo the belief that if a vampiric being stumbled upon a sack of rice, it would be compelled to count every single grain. This theme resonates in tales from the Indian subcontinent and South American folklore, 
where witches and mischievous spirits, much like vampires, engage in numerical rituals. Our ancestors, faced with the shadowy threat of these nocturnal beings, devised rituals that danced on the line between superstition and survival. One peculiar method involved leading a virgin boy through the hallowed grounds of a graveyard or church on a stallion of untainted virtue. The belief was that this sacred procession would reveal the presence of a vampire's resting place with the horse allegedly flinching at the undead's grave. And mind you, the horse had to be black, except of course in Albania, where tradition demanded a pure white steed for this quest. Another eerie indicator of vampiric lairs was the appearance of holes in the earth above a grave, an ominous sign that sent shivers down the spines of those brave enough to venture into the realm of the undead. Opening these suspected graves was not for the faint of heart. Villagers, gripped by terror, would recount tales of fresh blood smeared across the face of the corpse, a gruesome testament to the vampire's nocturnal feasting. Now, when it came to identifying a suspected vampire, our forebears had a keen eye for the unexpected. Far from the decaying cadavers we might imagine, these alleged bloodsuckers were often described as having a healthier appearance than one would expect, plump and showing minimal signs of decomposition. Picture that, a supposedly undead creature looking more robust than your neighbor who skipped too many dinners. But how did the community know when a vampire was on the prowl? Ah, my friends, there were signs. The death of livestock, be it cattle or sheep, was a telltale indicator. The unfortunate demise of relatives or neighbors also raised suspicions. Folkloric vampires, not content with mere blood-sucking, made their presence known through mischievous acts, a bit of poltergeist-styled activity, like stones raining on roofs or household objects mysteriously shifting. And let us not forget the unnerving tales of vampires pressing on the chests of the slumbering, a nocturnal visitation that sent shivers through the bravest souls. The methods our ancestors employed to identify vampires might seem peculiar in the light of modern knowledge, but they reflect a time when the line between the living and the undead was thin and blurred. First and foremost, we have the humble garlic, a kitchen staple turned vampire repellent. Hanging a string of garlic by your door wasn't just about seasoning your next meal, it was an age-old defense against blood-sucking intruders. Additionally, a branch of wild rose or hawthorn might also make a vampire think twice about paying you a visit, and in Europe, mustard seeds were casually sprinkled on rooftops to keep the undead at bay. Sacred items took center stage as well. A crucifix hanging on your wall, a rosary carefully draped over a bedpost, or a splash of holy water strategically placed around your dwelling. These were the barriers between you and the creatures of the night. Now let's talk geography. Folklore suggests that vampires have a bit of trouble navigating consecrated ground, like the hallowed precincts of churches or temples. And forget about them crossing running water, that's apparently a no-go zone. Makes you wonder if they ever considered swimming lessons. Mirrors, not just for checking your reflection, but also for warding off vampires. Placed facing outward on doors, mirrors were believed to repel these creatures, perhaps due to the notion that vampires lack reflections or shadows, a sort of metaphysical, out-of-sight, out-of-bite approach. Then, there's the curious tradition that a vampire can't crash at your place unless you invite them in. It's like having an unwelcome house guest. Once you open the door, they're free to come and go as they please. So, mind your manners and think twice before extending that invitation. And while folklore painted vampires as creatures of the night, they weren't exactly averse to sunlight. Reports from the 17th century claim that consuming bread baked with a vampire's blood mixed into the flour could grant protection. There are even tales suggesting that munching on a bit of dirt from the vampire's grave 
could do the trick. Who knew protecting oneself could be so down to earth? Now let's talk about the dark arts of dispatching vampires. The methods employed to rid the world of these nocturnal nuisances were as varied as the creatures themselves. The go-to move for many in South Slavic cultures was the trusty stake through the heart. Folk from Russia and the Baltic states had a penchant for using ashwood, while Serbia leaned towards hawthorn. In Silesia, oak took the stage, and aspen, believed to be the wood of Christ's cross, was a popular choice in certain regions. Staking wasn't a simple matter of one size fits all. The heart was the target for most, but in Russia and northern Germany, they went for the mouth, and up in northeastern Serbia, it was the stomach they aimed for. If a bloated vampire was on the loose, some folks thought piercing the chest skin would help deflate the disturbing creature. It's a bit like an early form of anti-vampire burial, where sharp objects like sickles were buried with the corpse just in case it decided to rise and shine. Now, if you found yourself in German or Western Slavic territory, decapitation was the preferred method. Heads were either buried in unconventional locations or spiked and pinned down to keep the pesky souls from lingering. The Romani people had their own unique approach, driving steel or iron needles into the heart, placing bits of steel strategically around the body, and even slipping hawthorn into the sock or through the legs. In Venice, archaeologists stumbled upon a 16th century burial where a brick was unceremoniously forced into a female corpse's mouth, a dramatic vampire-slaying ritual, according to those who uncovered it. For the more aggressive vampire hunters, pouring boiling water over the grave or resorting to complete incineration of the body were not unheard of. Southeastern Europe had its own arsenal. Vampires could be dispatched with a bullet, drowned, subjected to a repeated funeral service, sprinkled with holy water, or exorcised. Romania favoured the pungent power of garlic, and in the 19th century, there were those who took the precaution of shooting a bullet through the coffin. In truly stubborn cases, dismemberment, burning, and turning the remains into a curative cocktail administered to the family were deemed necessary. Meanwhile, in Saxon regions of Germany, a lemon found its way into the mouth of suspected vampires. The roots of our blood-sucking friends delve deep into the annals of mythology, where tales of supernatural beings feasting on the life essence of the living have echoed across the ages. Long before the term vampire graced our lips, Ancient civilizations wove intricate stories of demons, spirits, and even the devil himself, all partaking in the macabre act of consuming flesh and blood. In India, the Baital Pachisi housed accounts of Vitalas, ghoulish beings dwelling in corpses, while the Kathasarit Sagara chronicled the nightly quests of King Vikramaditya against an elusive one. Pishaka, the returned spirits of evildoers or the insane, added their vampiric touch to the tales. The Persians, always early to the mythical party, spun yarns of blood-drinking demons depicted on excavated pottery shards. Over in Babylonia and Assyria, the Lilitu, mother of Lilith and her daughters, the Lilu, made their mark as bloodsuckers with a penchant for infant blood. Estries, female shapeshifters, and blood-drinking demons roamed the night in Hebrew lore, seeking unsuspecting victims. An injured estuary could find healing through an odd combination of bread and salt provided by her attacker. Greco-Roman mythology added its own spin to the vampiric narrative. Empusai, born of the goddess Hecate, took on a demonic form with bronze feet, transforming into seductive women to feast on the blood of sleeping men. Lamia, with a penchant for the blood of young children, and the Geluds or Gelo shared a similar taste. Striges, often depicted with bodies of crows or birds, feasted not only on children but on adults as well, 
becoming the infamous Strix in Roman mythology, nocturnal birds with a taste for human flesh and blood. In the 12th century, British historians began chronicling accounts of revenants, adding a spooky touch to the medieval scene. These tales found company in the Old Norse Draga, a Nordic cousin to the vampire. Jewish literature, on the other hand, didn't quite dive into the vampire narrative until the 16th century. An uncharitable old woman who, due to an unguarded and unburied corpse, rose as a vampiric entity wreaking havoc among the living. Here, the lack of post-mortem guarding was seen as an invitation for malevolent spirits to set up shop in the deceased. Fast forward to 1645, where the Greek librarian Leo Alatius penned the first systematic exploration of Balkan vampire beliefs. These tales gained momentum in Eastern Europe during the late 17th and 18th centuries, eventually migrating to Germany and England. The legend grew like wildfire, fueled by embellishments and popularization. A notable entry in the Vampire Chronicles emerged from Istria in 1672. Villagers, gripped by panic, believed Jur Grando had become a vampire posthumously, feasting on blood and harassing his widow. In a bid to put an end to the terror, the village leader resorted to the classic stake-through-the-heart maneuver, topped with a beheading for good measure. Moving into the late 17th century, discussions on vampirism took a curious turn. Philippe Rohr, Otto, and Michael Ranft all had something to say about the dead allegedly munching on their shrouds in the grave. Ranft even detailed German traditions to prevent this macabre snacking, involving dirt mounds, coins, stones, and tightly tied handkerchiefs. As theological debates unfolded, the non-decay of vampires' bodies stirred echoes of the incorruptibility of Catholic saints. In 1732, an anonymous writer pondered the theological implications, while Johann Christoph Harenberg, in 1733, presented a general treatise on vampirism. The Marquis d'Argent cited local cases, and even the second edition of a work by Prospero Lambertini, Pope Benedict XIV, in 1749 addressed vampires. Lambertini, however, offered a skeptical perspective, attributing the phenomena to imagination, terror, and fear. In his eyes, the incorruption of saints was divine intervention, while vampires were mere products of the human mind. Eastern Europe in the 1700s was a time when Enlightenment ideas were starting to spread yet the belief in vampires gripped the hearts of the people tighter than ever. It was an era where not even government officials could resist the allure of hunting and staking these nocturnal creatures. The frenzy kicked off in 1721 with alleged vampire attacks in East Prussia, sparking a wave of panic that swept through the Habsburg monarchy from 1725 to 1734. Even government officials weren't immune to the vampire hunting fever, engaging in gruesome activities like staking and grave diggings to identify and slay potential revenants. Two infamous cases etch themselves into the annals of vampire lore. The first involves Peter Blagojevic from Serbia, who supposedly died at 62, but returned from beyond the grave, demanding food from his son. When denied, his son was found lifeless the next day, and Blagojevich reportedly went on to attack neighbors, who succumbed to the loss of blood. The second case unfolds with Milos Sekar, an ex-soldier turned farmer. After allegedly surviving a vampire attack in the past, Milos met his end while haying. Soon after, people in the vicinity started dropping dead, and the finger of suspicion pointed at Milos believed to have returned to prey on the neighbors. These incidents weren't just whispered tales. They were well documented. Government officials got involved, examining bodies, writing case reports, and even publishing books throughout Europe. This vampire craze, dubbed the 18th century vampire controversy, persisted for a generation, 
fueled by rural epidemics of so-called vampire attacks. In 1751, Dom Augustine Calmet, a French theologian and scholar, dropped a treatise titled Treatise on the Apparitions of Spirits and on Vampires or Revenants. The treatise, which analyzed evidence for vampirism, created a stir. Both a critical Voltaire and supportive demonologists interpreted it as asserting the existence of vampires. The madness finally waned in Austria when Empress Maria Theresa dispatched her personal physician, Gerard van Sweeten, to investigate. His conclusion? Vampires weren't real. Laws were enacted to stop grave openings and body desecrations, putting an end to the vampire epidemics. Other European countries followed suit. Beings having many of the attributes of European vampires appear in the folklore of Africa, Asia, North and South America, and India. Classified as vampires, all share the thirst for blood. In West Africa, among the Ashanti people, whispers speak of the Asenbosum, a creature with iron teeth dwelling amidst the trees, waiting to sink those metallic incisors into unsuspecting prey. Venture to the east, and you'll encounter the Impundulu in the eastern Cape region. This beast takes on the form of a fearsome taloned bird capable of summoning thunder and lightning. Quite the stormy character, wouldn't you say? Imagine facing a creature that not only thirsts for blood, but also commands the very elements. Now, let's hop over to the enchanting land of Madagascar, where the Betsileo people talk about the Ramanga. This outlaw or living vampire doesn't settle for a mundane diet, Oh no, it feasts on the blood of nobles and indulges in the peculiar habit of snacking on their nail clippings. Quite the refined taste for a creature of the night, wouldn't you agree? But wait, my friends, the tales don't end there. In colonial East Africa, rumors swirled like desert winds, suggesting that even those in the service of the state, such as firemen and nurses, could be vampires. Known in the poetic tongue of Swahili as Wazimamoto, these rumored bloodsuckers added a touch of mystique to the everyday roles of public servants. The Lugaru is a vampire-like entity born from the intriguing fusion of French and African Vodou beliefs. Originating from the mystic culture of Mauritius, the very name Lugaru bears resemblance to the French term loup garou, meaning werewolf, despite having nothing in common with weir creatures. But the Lugaru is not alone in its nocturnal escapades. Similar entities grace other corners of the world's folklore. In Trinidad, the Sucuyon takes her place, while in Colombian tales, the Tunda and Patasola dance in the shadows. Journeying south to the Mapuche of Chile, we encounter the Poichin, a blood-sucking serpent that slithers through the mythic landscape. Venturing into South American folklore, we discover a peculiar defense against vampiric beings. The humble aloe vera hung backward near a door. Who would have thought that a simple plant could serve as a barrier against the supernatural? But let's hop over to Aztec mythology, where the Chihuateteo, skull-faced spirits of women who perished in childbirth, enter the scene. These spectral beings not only stole children, but engaged in unsettling liaisons with the living, a macabre dance that drove mortals to madness. Now, turning our gaze to the pages of history, we find the belief in vampires embedded in 18th and 19th century New England. Rhode Island, and eastern Connecticut in particular, were hotbeds of such beliefs. Families grappling with the scourge of tuberculosis sought to unearth a perceived vampiric culprit. Loved ones were exhumed, hearts removed, and the deceased held responsible for the family's afflictions. The term vampire may not have been uttered, but the dread of these nocturnal visitations lingered in the air. Mercy Brown is a name etched in the annals of vampiric law. In the quiet town of Exeter, Rhode Island, in 1892, this young woman's demise stirred suspicions. 
In a desperate attempt to stave off the ravages of consumption, her father, assisted by the family physician, performed a ritual that echoed the ancient practices of old. Two months after her passing, Mercy was exhumed, her heart excised and reduced to ashes. Now let's journey into the mysterious realms of the Far East, where the darkness holds creatures far different from the vampires we know in the West. As we delve into the Asian folklore, we discover a diverse array of vampiric entities that have been haunting the imaginations of people for centuries. Firstly, let me introduce you to the Nukukubi, a peculiar being originating from Japan. Picture a head and neck that detach from its body, taking flight at night in search of human prey. It's a head-spinning concept, quite literally. Venturing into the archipelago of the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia, we encounter female vampiric beings of extraordinary abilities. The Mandarugo, known as the Bloodsucker in Tagalog folklore, shapeshifts into an attractive girl by day and morphs into a winged creature with a thread-like tongue by night, using it to suck blood from unsuspecting victims. Meanwhile, the Manananggal, hailing from the Visayan region, is an older, beautiful woman capable of severing her upper torso to fly with bat-like wings. She preys on sleeping pregnant women using a proboscis-like tongue to extract fetuses and indulging in a taste for entrails and phlegm. In the Malaysian folklore, we encounter the Penangalan, a woman who, through dark magic, can detach her fanged head at night, seeking the blood of pregnant women. Malaysians, fearing this nocturnal terror, hung thistles around doors and windows to deter her, showing the creative methods communities devised to protect themselves from the supernatural. Balinese folklore contributes the Layak, a creature similar to the Penangalan, emphasizing the universality of these nightmarish tales across different cultures. Meanwhile, in Indonesia and Malaysia, the Kuntilanak, Matyanak, Pontianak, or Langsuir, a woman who died during childbirth, rises as an undead seeking revenge and terrorizing villages. These creatures are described with long black hair covering a hole in the back of the neck, from which they suck the blood of children. Now let's hop over to Vietnam, where the term Ma Ca Rong originally referred to a demon haunting the Thai Dam ethnic minority. This creature stuffs its toes into its nostrils to fly into houses with pregnant women at night, sucking their blood before returning home to cleanse itself in barrels of sap and wood water. A unique blend of horror and hygiene, I must say. Lastly, we encounter the Jiangshi in Chinese folklore. These reanimated corpses hop around, absorbing life essence from their victims. Created when a person's soul fails to leave the body, these Jiangshi are depicted as mindless creatures with greenish-white, furry skin, perhaps inspired by fungus or mold growing on corpses. Hong Kong and East Asia experienced a cinematic boom in Jiangshi-themed films during the 1980s and 1990s, exemplified by titles like Encounters of the Spooky Kind and Mr. Vampire. Throughout the human history, the enigmatic allure of vampires has cast its spell on the collective imagination. The origins of these blood-sucking legends are as diverse as the cultures that spawned them, weaving tales, fear, superstition, and attempts to explain the mysteries of life and death. In the murky realms of pre-industrial societies, the natural but perplexing process of death and decomposition laid the groundwork for vampire beliefs. Suspicions of vampirism arose when a cadaver failed to adhere to the expected appearance of a normal corpse upon disinterment. Gases from decomposition swelled the body, forcing blood to ooze from the nose and mouth, creating a plump and ruddy illusion, especially striking if the deceased was pale in life. The Arnold Pohl case exemplifies how misinterpretations of decomposition signs led to the belief in vampiric activity, perpetuating the macabre myths that still haunt our nights. 
Vampire legends echo with the haunting possibility of individuals being buried alive, a stark reflection of the medical ignorance prevalent in bygone eras. Reports of sounds emanating from coffins, later revealed to be desperate attempts at escape evidenced by fingernail marks, fueled the fear of the undead. Yet, the question lingers, how could those presumed buried alive endure without sustenance? Whether it was the bubbling of escaping gases or the result of grave robbery, the terror of premature burial resonates through the ages, imprinting its mark on the genesis of vampire beliefs. Folkloric vampirism finds its roots entangled with clusters of unexplained deaths, mysterious illnesses haunting families and communities. The classical cases of Peter Blagojevich and Arnold Powell and the New England vampire beliefs linked to tuberculosis outbreaks reveal an epidemic undertone. David Dolphin's 1985 proposition connecting porphyria, a rare blood disorder, to vampirism brought attention to the medical realm. Although dismissed, the idea lingered, highlighting the eternal dance between folklore and science. Further exploration by neurologist Juan Gomez Alonso uncovers a potential link between rabies and vampire folklore, unveiling how disease, real or imagined, shaped the haunting narratives of these nocturnal creatures. That's it, fellow travelers. If you've found yourself captivated by the tales of these nocturnal beings, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Let's ensure these timeless stories continue to dance in the corridors of our collective imagination. Until our next venture into the realms of the unknown, may your nights be free of haunting whispers and your dreams untouched by the fangs of the supernatural. Stay curious, stay enchanted.